Good afternoon, and thank you for your endurance. <laughs> when I was a young boy, I suffered from severe neurological problems. And those problems plagued me until, as a young adult, I began to investigate the beautiful wildernesses along the, the west coast of the United States. And it was through these wilderness experiences that I was able to gain control of my symptoms and shed the neurological shackles that had so limited my life. It was also through these experiences that I realized just how precious and vulnerable wilderness and natural resources are. They had given me something I felt could never be repaid. So 23 years ago, when I had the opportunity in my career to begin working on protecting natural resources, I felt it was finally an opportunity to bring benefit to that which had benefited me so much. But unknowingly, it set me on an adventure that would change my life and the perception I had of the world around me. Now, this adventure reads just like a blockbuster Hollywood movie. I've even got the actors picked out. It has discovery, intrigue, challenges both physically and intellectually, periods of depression, exhilaration, and even a love affair. But it's not a movie. It's just a story of one microbiologist who learned an amazing lesson in life, and that is remarkable things can be achieved through cooperation. Now, this adventure began in a Seattle pub and a heated debate with my lab group over a fairly geeky science question, and that is, how do environmental stresses influence the genetic diversity of microscopic fungi? I told you it was geeky. <laughs> Hours later and many beers later, we had no resolution to this question, and so we decided that we should just go out and test it in nature. And that decision led me to a memorable collaboration with Dr. Joan Henson, a professor at Montana State University, the upper head, and Dr. Regina Redman, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab at the time, the lower head. It also took us to one of the most remarkable places in North America, and that's Yellowstone National Park, filled with geothermally heated pools and soils. Well, we decided to look at the, the microscopic fungi that lived in the geothermal soils, because in those soils, they experienced tremendous variation in heat stress throughout the year. In the winter, the, the soils are wet and warm, and in the summers, they dry out and become very hot. It was the perfect natural laboratory to resolve the Seattle discussion. But the microbes in the soil, that was really just the first and rather short chapter in this story. The real adventure began when we realized that there were plants living in these geothermal soils, plants that had adapted to these heat. Now, for 150 years, it was known that plants and natural ecosystems established symbiotic relationships with microscopic fungi. And as mentioned, Symbiosis is simply the intimate association between two different organisms. And it turns out that symbiosis is a truly fundamental component of plant and animal life on this planet. But at the time, it really wasn't understood if plants in high-stress habitats, say like a geothermal soil, uh, were symbiotic with fungi or not. So we looked at this plant throughout the park, and we just simply asked, is it symbiotic? And what we found was quite interesting. All of the plants were colonized by the same fungal species. And fortunately, we could grow the fungus and the plant free from one another. And we could ask the simple question, is there an ecological significance to this rather ubiquitous association that we can visualize? Well, what we found changed our paradigm of how plants adapt to stress in nature. It turns out that when you grow these partners separated from one another, neither of them can tolerate temperatures above 100 degrees. But when they grow together as a symbiosis, 
they can tolerate temperatures of 160 degrees or more. Now, the, the scientific paradigm is that plants, just like animals, adapt to stress by making changes in their DNA. And that over time, those changes allow them to tolerate these stresses, whatever they're faced with, adapt and establish in these habitats. Well, here's an example of a plant that had been in these geothermal habitats for a long time, probably millennia, and yet those plants were not adapted to this habitat, and neither was its symbiotic partner. The only way these two species could survive in these hot soils was to be heat tolerant, and they could only achieve that through cooperation, symbiosis. Well, with such an amazing observation, we, we had several questions. One, was it specific to this plant fungus thing? Some thought we were just lucky and we stumbled across the most unique thing on the planet. The other is, is it specific to the geothermal soils? Well, I can tell you that it's not to both. Right? These fungi have the ability to form symbiotic associations with genetically distant plants, say like tomatoes and watermelons. And guess what happens when those symbioses are established? Those plants become heat tolerant. So that functionality can be transferred across great genetic distances. So based on that, we wanted to know if this happened in other habitats. So we looked at stress habitats ranging from coastal beaches to high up on the sides of Mount Everest. And what we saw in every habitat we looked at and the plants we analyzed was that the plants themselves were not adapting to these stresses. They were no more adapted to those stresses than your average garden plant or a tomato for that matter. They adapted through cooperation. They adapted by forming symbiotic associations with microscopic fungi that lived totally inside those plants. And together, they could be stress tolerant. Now, just an as an aside here, I thought maybe they chose me to, to give a talk because, in reality, my talk is literally in between the spaces. These fungi grow in between plant cells. Right? They're in the, what are called the interstitial spaces of the plant, the, the non-vascular apoplasts, the dead spaces. It's the space in between. Well, armed with the knowledge that plants can be adapted to stress via symbiosis, we decided to take on the greatest threat to civilization in this century, which is the impact of climate change on food and water security. Now, to put it in perspective, the human population lives on less than 20 plant species. These provide the staple sustenance for us. And three of these species supply 60% of that sustenance. Now, each of these species has a limited geographic range in which they can be optimally produced. Some are done on multi multiple continents, some are not. But the, but the point is, is that severe climate stress, say drought, for example, in one location can have profound impacts on food security around the world. Drought has plagued agriculture and civilization throughout history. In fact, it has so much so that drought-tolerant crops are considered a holy grail of agriculture. Over the last three or four decades, there have been billions of dollars spent, an enormous effort put in, to generate drought-tolerant crops, either through genetic modifications or by breeding traits from plants in nature that have adapted to the stresses people were interested in, in this case, drought stress. But I think I just told you that in nature, plants adapt via symbiosis. And so those approaches have not had, had very good success. And we felt we had identified the key to generating stress-tolerant crops. So in 2008, uh, Regina Redman diverged from academic research to ask the question, could these microscopic fungi be developed and commercialized to mitigate the impacts of climate change in agriculture? And just because uh, I mentioned it up front, I know it's just burning in some of your heads. Uh, Regina is the love affair part of this adventure, and, and we are now married. 
Well, I'm very proud to stand here today and say that over the last two and a half years, a group of very dedicated young scientists has been working with Regina and I, and we have developed these formulations of microorganisms that can simply be sprayed onto the seeds of crop plants, planted, and the emergent plants are resistant to drought, temperature, and salt stress. Field testing across the U.S. has demonstrated that under severe drought, these treated plants can achieve 85% yield uh, increases above the untreated plants. And even in low-stress, normal growing years, we still see an average of about 7% increase in yield in these, in these treated plants versus untreated. And this all happens with the plants consuming less water. So this is fantastic news for agriculture in the developed world. But the majority of farmers on this planet are poor and have small land holdings. The future of food security is really dependent on technologies like this reaching those poor farmers. But that's a challenge economically, especially for small companies. Now, fortunately, there are government programs like USAID's Saving Water for Food, uh, there's a US India Endowment Fund that have given us some funding to begin testing this technology in countries where the need is great. In India alone, we've tested on five crops and we've seen an average of 29% yield increase across those five crops. One of those crops was wheat. Right? So to put it into kind of a human impact concept, if we were to apply this technology to all of the wheat in India, and we saw a 29% yield increase, that would result in enough extra grain to feed 75 million people each year. And most remarkable is it would happen without requiring any additional land, fertilizer, labor, and of course our most precious resource, water. It's a truly remarkable technology, and you know, it's been being developed by nature for about 450 million years when plants moved onto land. Well, today, civilization sits at a precipice where social needs are great. Food insecurity is far too common. And way, way too many people choose to ignore the current and looming threats of climate change. Our only hope for a bright and sustainable future is to mount a massive and global response to mitigate the impacts of climate change, but to reverse the trends that got us into this hole to begin with. I believe that can only happen if we embrace an ancient biological concept, which is achievement through cooperation. Now, I'd like to leave you with this time-lapse video because I want to demonstrate to you the, the profound impact a lowly little fungus can have on its plant host. And I ask that you, you open your minds to new concepts, new ideas, new paradigms. Let us not fear the paradigm shift. Let us embrace how little we know, how much we can learn, and the truly profound accomplishments that we can achieve through cooperation. Thank you.